Hi there! My name is Neil Blevins, and this lesson is called Concept Design for Games vs. Films. So first a bit about myself. After 16 years of working at Pixar, where I did a number of jobs including Digimat, modeling and texturing, and visual development 3D concept art, I decided it was time to move into concept art full-time, and I also made the shift from film to games. So now, almost four years into my modern gaming career, I've had a chance to observe, experience, and learn the similarities and differences in the job of concept artist in both mediums. So here's some of what I've learned, in case there are others like me who are making the switch and want to have some idea of the major differences, or perhaps you're a student who's trying to decide what to specialize in, whether it be games or films. So some quick notes. Uh, this will focus on the art aspect, not the business aspect of games and films. Um, second of all, this is all from my perspective, and so it won't be as broad as if it were an article covering the experiences of a large group of people. So just to clarify, my experience was being an on-site staff artist for animated features, and being a freelance and on-site staff artist for AAA first-person and third-person games. So stuff like, for example, 2D mobile games won't be included in this discussion. And then finally, in video games, the game designer refers to the person who's designing the gameplay, challenges, rules, and interaction that define a game. They also frequently set up or have a team uh, set up simple 3D levels called gray boxes that are used to test out the gameplay. And they're also used as a layout for the final levels. Now a concept designer or a concept artist is a different job, and that's the job that I do. So they produce visuals and design the form of the world's objects and characters in the game based on the functions designed by the game designers. So I just wanted to clarify that because I'll be using these two terms a lot in this video. So perhaps the number one thing I learned all those years working at Pixar is that story is king when it comes to great films. So every discipline in the filmmaking process is there to enhance the story our characters are going through, and that of course includes concept art. So every shot in a Pixar film is just filled with artistic choices that are meant to enhance the story. But here's just two examples to illustrate the point. First, at the beginning of The Incredibles, young Mr. Incredible is at the top of his game, in the prime of his life, and everything is going awesome. And then over here is a shot a little later on where Bob no longer is doing hero work, and he now works at an insurance company and all the joy has left his life. So notice how the colors on the first image sequence over here are strong, saturated, and striking. And the second image here is almost monochromatic, dull and lifeless. This is not by accident. The colors used in these two sequences are designed specifically to enhance the story point. Bob's life used to be awesome and colorful, and now it sucks and is bland. Here's another example from Incredibles 2. Helen is now the breadwinner, and her new job is taking her away both physically and mentally from her family. So when a painting needed to be designed for the hotel room Helen is staying in, the painting was made to be an abstract portrait of Helen, alone on the right side of the painting, and her family far away on the left side of the painting. Hundreds of these decisions are being made all the time. How can we incorporate the story into every aspect of the film's concept design? So what about video games? Is Story King? For some heavily narrative-driven games, maybe. But for the most part, action-adventure, hack-and-slash, first-person shooter, AAA-style games, the thing that is most important is the player experience. Basically, you need to put yourself into the role of the player in the game and design everything to enhance that experience. So you'll want to enhance the fun the player is experiencing, immerse the player in the world. Um, if um, you're playing this game, what would you expect to see? What would you want to see? What concept design decisions would make you happier? What decisions would help me traverse the space that I've been put into? Uh, what concept design decisions will help me find the bad guy and beat the bad guy? So video games have a king, it's just a slightly different king. So for the rest of this video, I will outline 10 specific differences I've observed, big and small, now doing concept design for games. At their core, each point is really focus on the player experience, but I'll give these practical examples to bring the point home. So number one is design for the 360. In my film experience, a lot of things could be designed to look good from only one angle. I mean, if it's just a single shot in the film and the camera doesn't move much, design the front of the object and there's really no reason to design the back of the object. Now while there's a portion of that in games, like for example if you're doing a set of buildings that are made specifically to block the players from going in a certain direction, far more objects will need to be seen from every angle because you never know quite where the player is going to walk. So keep this in mind, your objects will more likely be seen from every angle, so you really need to think in 3D. 
So number two is extra attention on a character's back. This is similar to point one in that you want to design for the 360, but it's a little bit more specific to characters. I mostly focus on environments and props when I'm doing my concept design, but many character concept artists have told me to make sure that when doing a concept for the playable character, especially if the game is a third person game, spend a lot of time designing their back to look really cool. Because it's likely the player will spend a lot of time staring at it. So maybe a flat red cape looks cool from the front of the character, but it'll be really dull if that's all you see for 90% of the game when you're staring at their back. Number three is avoid giant spaces that aren't fun to traverse. So in films, if a hallway is 20 meters, but you don't want to spend 10 seconds of screen time walking down it, you just use a cut. But in games, there are no cuts, except in cinematics. The player will have to walk down that whole hallway, so will that be boring for them? So there's a whole design department whose job is to create the 3D world in such a way that the player doesn't get bored or annoyed, but how can you, the concept artist, help them with that job? So for example, if there's a long hallway, maybe placing a couple of interesting items in the hallway will help break up the monotony. Or if the map the player is in is one kilometer by one kilometer, then you need to take that into account when you're doing your concept art. So in films, it's easy to paint these huge structures or vistas, but in a game, you're more likely to be limited in scale. So if you're asked to paint an environment, get some idea how big the environment is going to be first. So basically what you want to do is avoid painting a 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer sized monolith if the actual size of the playable map is only 1 kilometer by 1 kilometer. Also, if the 3D world is quite large, it's likely you'll be designing some sort of vehicle, like a motorcycle, a car, a spaceship, uh, maybe horses, so the player can uh, traverse faster through the environment. But if the environment is smaller, it's more likely you won't be designing much in the way of vehicles, because the game designers don't want the player traveling across the world too quickly. So number four is metrics. This is another related concept. Uh, video game design metrics refers to the size things need to be in order to allow the game to function and be enjoyable. While this is something that needs to be carefully considered by the game designers and the team building the final levels, it's also something that needs to be considered by the concept department. For example, maybe all the characters in the game need to be between 5 and 7 feet in order for them to share a skeleton. In which case, when designing characters, you need to keep that in mind, and don't make characters that are too big or too small, unless you're ready to try to persuade the game designers that it's necessary for the game to be awesome. Or don't design characters with forearms unless you know the skeleton tools of the company can handle it. On the environment side, maybe for the AI to have two NPCs walking through a door at the same time successfully, the door needs to be 8 feet wide. That might change the proportions of the designs you put on the door in your concept art. And keep in mind that metrics are a give and take, especially in the blue sky phase of concept. You don't want to bring so many metrics into the process that it stifles creativity. But some metrics are important even at that stage, and they get more and more important as you enter into the production phase of concept. Number five is lead the player's eye to lead them in space. So many games have a goal to achieve that involves going from point A to point B, and this can be enhanced through concept design. So for example, in Destiny 2, you start a level seeing this giant something far off in the distance, and you go, what is that? And uh, that looks cool, I want to go there. So as you travel along killing enemies, you get closer and closer, and start seeing this giant building peek out above the landscape. And now you're close enough to see what the structure is, and you ask yourself, well, how do I get there? And it's like, oh, I see, there's this bridge thing. So you follow the bridge, and then you go inside to reach your final goal, which is this bright thing in this dark corridor. This sort of leading the player needs to be a concern when it comes to your concepts. For example, making an entire area a giant pit may seem like a good idea from a visual perspective, but a pit can't be seen from far away, and so won't be an ideal design to lead the player in a particular direction. You can also lead the player using all the standard composition rules, as discussed in my tutorial Contrasts in Composition, which is linked in the description. For example, if everything near you is dark, and the thing off the distance is bright, people will travel towards it. Or if things close to you are desaturated, and the thing in the distance is super colorful, people will head towards it. Using all the composition rules that lead the eye around the painting can be equally used to literally lead the character in the environment. So when lighting a level, for example, the lighters may place lights not just to make the picture look pretty, but also to lead the player. So if I'm ever in a level of a video game and I don't know where to go, I frequently look to where the light has been placed in dark areas, and that frequently tells me where I'm supposed to head. 
So in doing a concept, keep in mind light placement is also a way to get the player to travel in a specific direction. Here's another practical example, again from Destiny 2. Notice how these well-placed lights, they lead you from where you are to this one ledge, and then to this higher ledge, and then eventually to the exit. There is even a well-placed tree log here that points directly towards the exit to help direct the player. In a related note, a skybox is the unplayable area beyond the main map in 3D space. So these used to just be skies, hence the name, but now can include all sorts of 3D geometry like terrain to help make the world seem larger even if the playable area isn't that huge. When doing concept design for a skybox, remember to include points of interest. These can be good landmarks to help orient the player so they always know what direction they're pointing in, like north, south, east, or west. And then objects in the skybox can also be aspirational content. Make the player want to travel to a particular area in the skybox because it looks neat. And maybe one day you'll do a DLC, you know, expansion of the game, and you can actually include that new location. So number six is cover objects. I played a lot of video games, but until I started working on them, I didn't realize how many objects are placed in 3D shooting games as cover objects, objects the players can hide behind to avoid getting shot. After this was explained to me, I can now not play video games without constantly noticing cover objects everywhere. So I expect to design a lot of crates and barrels. And it's extra important to make sure that these objects are large enough for your player to hide behind. So if your player is a 10 foot tall robot, you won't be designing many wooden boxes, but you're likely going to be designing lots of shipping containers. So number seven is distance visibility. Especially in shooting games, it's important to be able to tell some information from far away, and that will affect your concept design. As two examples, first, short stubby weapons don't work well on enemies, because you want the player at a glance to be able to tell what direction the enemy gun is pointed. So favor longer barrels, or find other tricks like special shaped muzzle flashes to make sure it's obvious what direction the bullets are flying. Or as a second example, in the game Disintegration from V1, one of the artists told a story about how the bad guys originally had black suits, but once they tested the game out, they realized that the bad guys were tough to see on the landscape because their color wasn't different enough from the environment. And so the art direction changed and the enemy suits became white. So number eight is designing buildings. So first of all, pass-through opportunities. When building architecture, give plenty of ways to pass through the architecture, like a sky bridge or adding 45 degree angles on the side of buildings, so the player doesn't have to walk uh, around too many hard 90 degree angles. It'll speed up the player's travel from point A to point B, which will make them happy. Next is avoid flat buildings. Your player will likely be walking down a lot of streets, and so see a lot of buildings not from face on, but from a glancing angle. So make sure the buildings have ins and outs and dimension like planters, balconies, window shutters, awnings, etc. That being said, also make sure that the buildings aren't so dimensional that your player has to be constantly ducking, jumping, or weaving in and out in order to avoid hitting things. One trick we used frequently in films was if we needed more space inside a building than the outside allowed, we'd frequently have two completely different sets that wouldn't fit together, and we just made the rule that we wouldn't have any shots moving from the outside to the inside or vice versa, so no one would realize it's two completely different sets. This kind of trickery happens less in a 3D game, since the character will more likely be going in and out of buildings a lot, and there's no cuts to hide the seam, so make sure the inside space matches the size of the outside. Next, uh, many 3D maps are made up of prefabs, which are basically pieces of geometry that get used again and again, with specialized models to use now and again to break up the repeating pattern of the prefabs. So after the blue sky concept is done, you're likely going to be doing a bunch of detailed designs, and you may be asked to make modular pieces that can be reconfigured to make lots of different things, kind of like designing Lego uh, that the game designers will assemble. And then finally, a little fun way, uh, doorway height. If a player wants to get from point A to point B fast, they're likely to jump to get there faster. If so, better make sure that all your doorways between point A and B are high enough that a player can jump through them without bonking their head, or else the player is going to get frustrated. So number nine is painting over gray boxes. Now this isn't super different from films, but I found it's a little bit more common on the game side. So the game designer has uh, laid out a map, uh, which is known as a gray box, which is basically just a simplified version of the map that has all the correct dimensions set up for the space. And then your job as the concept artist will be to paint over top of it to show what the final game might look like. So here's an example from Disintegration. The first image is a gray box, 
and the second is the paint over to give the world art team an idea of what the final set could look like. And finally number 10 is know your cameras. So if possible, get from the game designers what lens they're going to be using in the game. And note that there might be two different answers, because frequently a different lens is used on console versus PC. And then once you know that, use that lens for all the work that you're doing. If you're doing 3D concept art, just plug the lens into the software. And if you're doing 2D concept art, at least try and mimic the lens. It's not important to be exact, but if your concept can mimic at least generally the player experience, that's super helpful. So hopefully you found these experiences interesting, and maybe they'll help you if you decide to make the transition from film to games. So thank you very much for watching, and if you want to be notified the next time I post a new video like this, feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Or if you want to see or read a bunch of other tutorials about art-related topics, go to neilblevins.com and go to the Art Lessons section. So thank you very much, and have a great day!